talk to you about something real quick. Sometimes, sometimes in, in your life, and I'm going to share this, so, so please just, uh, just go with me on this. Listen, there are some times that you may feel that there is a rub between you and someone else in the body. And, and if you don't go and deal with that right away, you know what happens? Satan has a heyday on you or at, on me or whoever. He has a heyday. And the reason is, is because he makes you think that there's something going on that may not even be going on there. And you sit there and you struggle with it and you lay in bed with it at night and you, you toss and turn over it and all these things. So whenever you feel like there's something between you and someone else in the body, what should you do immediately? Deal with it. Go and talk to that person. Don't let it fester. Amen? Don't let that happen. Don't let that happen. I, I, I share this not, not to embarrass anybody and I won't, I won't speak names, okay? But the reality is, is that if you feel like there's something between you and somebody, go and be reconciled to them. Most times, I promise you this, there's nothing there. There's nothing there. Right? It's your mind working. You think that something's going on and ain't nothing going on. Because Satan's having a field day with you. Don't let him, don't let him, don't let him have that victory. Amen? Don't let him have that victory. So I just want to encourage you in that. Be reconciled to one another out of love. Amen? I am in uh, Luke chapter 17. Yeah, one whole verse. Verse 1. I have a title this morning's sermon, The Snare of Sin. The Snare of Sin. Please stand for the reading of the Word. Yeah, read the whole scripture. You can make it. <laughs> Luke 17, 1. And he said to his disciples, Temptations to sin are sure to come, but woe to the one through whom they come. Please be seated. Temptation. Temptation. I, I looked at this in the Greek and it's, it, it's an interesting word because what temptation really is, is the part of the trap to which bait is attached. The trap or the snare itself. So there's something attached to it to make it lure something in. And, and I got to tell you, Julie and I are having this issue right now in our lives. Amen? What are you talking about, Chuck? I've got, I've, somehow or another, we, we, we picked up an infestation of mice. And they've been having a field day in the house and we did not know. We <laughs> bring cats. You know, my house strange happening at your house is happening all over. My sister and her daughter both have mice issues really bad too. So we we've been we've been on this constant battle between the mice and we feel like we we're winning, but every now and then we get another one, amen. <laughs> So, so what, what's the point? Well, how do, how do you catch a mouse? Well, because I got to tell you, when we first started these things, it was amazing. We, we thought we had the upper hand on the mice. No, they had the upper hand on us. Man, we, put, we put the bait out there, and I come down, and I come down to the traps, and guess what? All oh, the bait's gone. I'm like, how is this possible? I mean, I, I'm trying to set the trap. I can't even set the trap without the thing going off, Amen. And I'm like, how in the world is this mouse eating everything off of the thing that I've got? I can't even hardly touch it. It's, it's an amazing thing. But every now and then, listen, every now and then, as they're chewing on the bait, they get so caught up in the bait that they don't realize that the snap trap's coming. Ooh, watch it. Traps are set to catch you. They're set up to lure you in. And in the end, to destroy you. To end your life. That's what they're designed to do. That's what Satan wants to do to you. He wants to lure you in through, through the temptation of sin in order to destroy you and to make you not what God wants you to be. What are they drawing you away from? What do these temptations bring you? What are they drawing you away from? A right relationship with God. That's what temptation does to you. It draws you away to something else rather than being focused upon God and what He would have for you, and what He has designed for you. The Lord is there. It comes in many forms, amen? Many forms, temptation comes. Ultimately, they want to draw you away from God's will so that Satan can have the victory and bring death in your life. In this sense, they lead you away and ensnare you to keep you from fulfilling God's real purpose and true design for you and for your life. Look at James. James 1, 13-15. Let no one say when he is tempted, I am being tempted by God. For God cannot be tempted with evil, and he himself tempts no one. So temptation doesn't come from who? 
He doesn't tempt you. That, does, that goes contrary to the character and nature of God. Absolutely. God, God does not want you to be brought into sin. That's, that's ridiculous. That isn't the way. In fact, He wants the complete opposite. He wants to lead you out of sin and into what's right. So why would it make sense for Him to set up things that would lead you away from Him? It doesn't. It doesn't line up with Scripture, does it? God doesn't tempt anyone. But each person is tempted when he is lured and enticed by his own. There's the key. We've been talking about this for a while in this church. Our desires. Our own desires versus the desires of God. There is a distinction. There is a difference. You're lured away to sin because of your own desire. And what you desire deep down in your heart, that's what lures you away. That's the lure. That's, that's the bait that's set at the trap. The lure is the sin that you see or the thing that you want to do wrong. It isn't of God. And when you give in to it, what happens? Then desire is conceived, right? That means it's what? It's right. It, it, it gets inside of you. You get this desire in you and it gives birth to sin. That's what grows up. And sin, when it's fully grown, brings forth what? Death. Again, sin. The temptation of it. The drawing of it into your life and to draw you away from what God wants for you is designed for one thing and one thing only, to lead you out of God's will and to bring death in your life. There it is, our own desire and what we desire, which draws us away and, and entices us to come to the bait and be entrapped. When desire is conceived, it gives birth to sin, and sin, when it's fully grown, it produces death. Know this, though. It is your flesh's desire that leads you away from God, not God's. It's your flesh's desire. It's not God's desire. It's your own desire. So then what's the cure? Seeking God's desire. Seeking God's desire? Die to self. Die to self? I need to get new desires, don't I? My desires need to be transformed. I need to get a hold of God's desires, like, like, like my sister's saying. I need to get a, my desires need to change. Well, how do I get that change? Where does it come? Where's it going to come from? Say it again. It is in the power of the Lord. It is in the power of the Lord. He gives us many venues of how to get a hold of His desires. Look, even your Lord and Master dealt with it. What? Temptation. But He was able to recognize it and to avoid it because He knew His Father's will. He, he, he knew who and what He was designed to be and He knew where He was going. Even more so, his love for his father override, overrode his flesh's desire and let him fulfill God's plan and purpose for his life. Did you hear that? His love for God became more what? Important. His love for his father was more important than his own self-preservation. His love for his father was more important than his own glory and his own riches. His love for his father. He loved God more than he loved himself. And I want to tell you this. If you, if you, we, I've been saying this for a while now, but if you begin to love God the way that you're supposed to, and you love Him with all that you are, you can't help but love what He loves. Amen. You love God with all that you are, you will love what He loves. And you know what He loves? People. people. So this is what, it, it tears me up, because there are many, many people out there today that will not come into fellowship. They will not come to church anymore. They find every excuse to. And they tell you things like, well, I'm going to get away. I can get away. I can go worship God in nature. Yeah, you can. But if you go up in the mountain like Moses did and you get close to God, you can, if you will really get close to God, you cannot help but come down the mountain and minister to people. You know why? Because God loves the people. <laughs> and if He's loving them and you say you're going to get close to God, what is He going to send you right back to? The people. That's what he did to Jesus. Even Jesus got away, went up on the mountain. Where did he come back down to? The people to whom he was sent. Look, even Peter went through temptation. Matthew 16, 21 through 26. From that time, Jesus began to show his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem. Where is that leading to? Calvary. And suffer many things from the elders and chiefs and priests and scribes and be killed and then the third may be raised. He knew it was coming. And Peter took him aside. Listen to this. His own disciple took him aside and began to rebuke him, saying, Far be it from you, Lord, this shall never happen to you. Peter's what? He's thinking of he's thinking of what? He's thinking about himself. He's thinking about he's thinking about his mind's not set on God. 
His mind's not set upon him. The devil's in his mind. And he began, but he turned and said to Peter, Get behind me, Satan. You are a hindrance to me. For you are not setting your mind on the things of God, but the things of man. There's the key. That, that is the key. This is, where, this is where we need to be as people. As mature Christians, this is where we need to be. We need to begin to think and set our minds upon the things of God and not the things of man. Amen. Set your mind on the things of God. Then Jesus told his disciples, if anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever will save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. For what will profit man if he gains the whole world and yet forfeits his soul? Or what shall a man give in return for his soul? What? What would you give for your soul? That's what it comes down to. Even Jesus dealt with it. Even Jesus dealt with it. Nothing was going to take his focus off of his father and the love that God had put into him for what? For his purpose and his design. He's going to the cross. He knows, his, he knows what's coming. Is he going to run from it? No. Because it's God's design for his life. We cannot help but ask the question and be confronted by the Spirit's conviction. What are our minds set upon? The thing and interests of God or upon our own? See, Peter was focused upon his own desire and his own will and not upon God's desire and God's interest. So then the flesh desire does this. What does a life consume with God's desires and interests lead to? Are you hearing me? If, if, if the mind and the heart is set upon the flesh and the things of the flesh, where does that lead? To death and destruction. Away from God and away from what God wants designed for you and what He wants you to be in the body and what he, how He wants you to be a light in the world and the love that He wants to demonstrate through you. And if you choose to do that, you will find yourself away from God. You will find yourself in a terrible place. But what is it like to be on the opposite side of that? Well, right here, right now. What's going on in the body? Right here, right now. To build up, to strengthen, to encourage, to inspire love, to inspire people to hope, to inspire people to salvation, and a desire to do what God wants them to do, not what their flesh wants them to do. To be swallowed up and consumed to that? i got to tell you, when you're really living your life for God, you've got to be fulfilled. I can't imagine that you can't be fulfilled in life when you're doing exactly what God wants you to be and do. There's no greater joy in life than to find yourself in God's will, amen, and doing what He wants you to do. A life fulfilled. A life full of promise. A life full of hope. Full of love. And an awesome love for God and all He is in love with. That's right. That you will become in love with what He is in love with. Huh. It leads to a mindset upon Jesus and everything He purchased for us by His life, through His death, and by His resurrection. The very inheritance of the kingdom of God for His saints, and that by the blood that He shed for you on Calvary. Look, through His blood, you have the ability to participate in everything that He's purchased for you in the kingdom. Thank you. Everything. You've, you've got a hold of it. You, you've, 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 oh, he's bought it for you. He's paid for it in His own blood. Amen. You will be consumed by it. It will be your only focus. And you will love what He loves. You will desire what He desires. And it will change your interest to what He is interested in. That's how it works. That's, how, that's what it's like to be, have a life filled with God and what He wants for you and a life full of Christ. Amen? Look at this, Philippians 2, 1 through 8. So if there's any encouragement in Christ, do you have any encouragement in Christ? We heard some this morning, didn't we? Yes. Is there any comfort through His love? You got that? Yeah. You, you got any participation with the Spirit? Yeah. Yes. Any affection and sympathy? Complete my joy by being of the same mind. Have the same mindset. Have the same love. Being full accord and of one mind. Do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility, consider others more significant than yourselves. So your life isn't about you. <laughs> your life is about everyone else. Let each of you look not only to his own interests, but also to the interests 
of others, especially the interests of God. Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus. Well, you catch that? It's yours. It's yours if you want it, if you'll take it. We were talking about this this morning. Matthew, two guys, two separate guys. Matthew, sitting at the tax booth. Jesus said what? Come, follow me. Did he say, nah, not today? <laughs> huh? Is that what he said? No. What did he do? No. He got up and left. He did exactly what Jesus told him to do. He, he bought into it. He, he did it. He did exactly what the Lord wanted him to do. He, he grabbed a hold of it. Versus the rich young ruler. He had, now, this guy, the Lord had a conversation with him. He said, you know, do this, 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 and this. And, 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 and he goes, but Lord, I've already done all that. Look. He goes, and, and the scripture says that Jesus loved him. And Jesus loved him. And he said, well, then go. Go, go sell all your possessions and then come follow me. And he went away a broken-hearted man. Why? Because he loved his riches more than he loved in the things of God. You get that? Two separate, look, what do you love? What do you really love? That points it out. Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped. He wasn't worried about that, but emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of man and being found in human form. He humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death. Look, his obedience to God led him where? His obedience led him there. Philippians 2, 20 through 21. For I have no one like him. Who's, he, who's Paul talking about? Timothy. For I have no one like him who will be generally concerned for your welfare. For they all seek their own interests, not those of Jesus Christ. This is one of those scriptures that when you're going through the Bible and you come across that, it's the conviction of the Holy Spirit just pounds me. What's my interest? What are your interests? Are you concerned about your own or the interests of Jesus? What, what do you think he's concerned with? Saving more, souls. Saving more souls. Primary goal. He cares about you. He loves you. You know how he demonstrates it? Look around you. Look around you. This is how he demonstrates it. By the people that he's put in your life. Amen? Amen. Each one of us have come to Christ somehow through someone, <laughs> shape, form, or manner. Why? Because Christ loved you enough to bring you the message. Be of the same mindset as your Lord and Master and set your hearts upon it. Allow Him to change your desires from the flesh to His own desires. Seek His interests and the things He loves and your life will be full of life. Have a perfect relationship with Him and never let it go and let nothing Get in the way between you and Christ. Let nothing come between you and Him. Nothing. Not your wife. Not your children. Not your cars. Not your money. Nothing. Let nothing come between you and Him. Hmm. Matthew 26, 39-42 And going a little farther, He fell, fell on His face and prayed, saying, we're speaking of Jesus, right? My Father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. He's, he's inquiring of who? He's asking who? His God. He's asking, nevertheless, not what I will, but as you will. So there are some times that I have desires that I even, even if, though it sounds good, it's not good. It's not what God wants for me. Amen? And you, you tell me where Jesus is going from this place. You know, right? He's, he's fixing to be arrested. He's fixing to go through the pain and the suffering. <laughs> that he needs to go through. And he came to his disciples and found them sleeping. And he said, Peter, so could you not watch with me one hour? Not just one hour. Watch and pray that you, what? You got that? Watch and pray that you may not enter into temptation. You want to avoid temptation? Here's a key. How do you get away from it? Watch and uh, we got to pray. You got to watch. You got to be aware of what's going around you. And you need to pray. Watch and pray that you may not enter into temptation. The Spirit is indeed willing. Your Spirit, the Spirit of God inside of you is willing for the will of God. It's willing for the things of the Spirit. It's willing for the things of the kingdom of heaven. It's willing for it. The Spirit is. I need to be, my will needs to be swallowed up in the Spirit's will. Amen? I need to buy into that. I need to grab a hold of it and never let it go. 
Watch and pray that you may not enter the temptation, because the spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. Again, for the second time, he went away and prayed, My father, this cannot pass unless I drink it. Your will be done. That's an emphatic statement. Jesus was willing to say, I want your will done, not mine. I need that in my life. You need that in your life. How simple and yet so difficult. You see that there? What is prayer? What is it? It is communion with God. It it is talking to Him. It it is letting Him speak to you. It, It is your personal relationship with Him. Making Him the priority and seeking Him. And we'll keep you from it. What? Temptation. You get that? What do we what did, what did he tell us to do? Watch and pray. Why? Because when I go into prayer, I have communion with God. I'm talking to God. I'm not, I'm not immediately when the temptation comes, I need to be going into prayer. I need to be talking to my father. And I promise you, you need to be talking to your father. Because he's not going to let you go in with it. When you begin to talk to him, he's going to inspire you to something else. Something of him. There's some way, form, or manner of escape. But the priority, the number one priority, drop it. You know, they say when you get caught on fire, what are you supposed to do? Stop dropping low. And some people would call that a Pentecostal movement. Amen? (laughs) Stop dropping pray. When you see the temptation come, stop dropping pray. Seek your Father's face and He will help you with it. Matthew 26, 39 through 42. That's how you avoid it. Hebrews 2, 17 through 18. Therefore, he had to be made like his brothers in every respect, so that he might become a merciful and faithful high priest in the service of God, to make propitiation for the sins of the people. For because of him, he himself has suffered when tempted, he is able to help those who are being tempted. What does that tell you? Jesus understands. Your temptations, Jesus understands. He knows what you're going through. He sympathizes with you. But He's also there to help you. He understands. He overcame it. So if your Lord and Master overcame it, don't you think He would inspire you to understand how to overcome it too? And not to be drawn into it? He would. Hebrews 3, 1-6 through Therefore, hello, brothers, you who share in the heavenly calling, raise your hand, Heavenly calling, sure, yep. Yeah. You, you who share in the heavenly calling, consider Jesus, the apostle and high priest of our confession, who was faithful to him who appointed him, just as Moses was also faithful in all God's house. For Jesus has been counted worthy of more glory than Moses, as much more glory as the builder of a house has more honor than the house itself. For every house is built by someone, but the builder of all things is God. Now Moses was faithful in God's house as a servant, to testify to the things that were spoken later. But Christ is faithful over God's house as a son. Raise your hand because he's talking about you. He's faithful over his house. And we are his house if we indeed hold fast our confidence and our boasting and our hope. Faithfulness. Faithfulness is the key there if you didn't pick up on it. Faithful to what? Faithful to the relationship. Make him your number one priority. Faithful to watch him pray. Again, seek him. Faithfulness to the treasure and inheritance of the things of God and living a life full of His love. Those things. Be faithful to those things. Look, 1 Corinthians 10, 12, and 14. Therefore, let anyone who thinks that he stands take heed lest he fall. No temptation. How many? No. None. No. No temptation has overtaken you that is not common to man. So this is not common to God. It's common to man. God is faithful. I want to be like Him. Don't you? God is faithful, and He will not let you be tempted beyond your ability. But with the temptation, He will also provide a way of escape that you may be able to endure. Therefore, my beloved, flee from idolatry. What's he, so what do I need to do? I need to, have, I need to watch. When the temptation, whatever it might be in your life, comes, I need to watch. I need to open my eyes. Because somehow, no, there's a door of opportunity to leave. There's some, there's some opportunity for me to... What do you do when, you, when, when something goes bad in some place? What do you do? Pray. Pray? Run! 
Look, it says it right there. What, what do you flee? You see it there? Flee! The door's open so that you can flee from it. You don't have to participate in it. You don't have to say it. You don't have to sin. You don't have to. There's so many Christians out there that believe that today. You know what? I might as well sin. I can just get over with that way. I can go back to God and ask for forgiveness. Let's just get it done and over with. Don't. Flee. You don't have to sin. You don't have to. Hebrews 4, 14 through 16. Since then, we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God. Let us hold fast our confession. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who in every respect has been tempted as we are and yet was without sin. Let us then with confidence draw near to the throne of grace. What was he talking about? What do we draw? How do you draw near to the throne? How do you do that? <laughs> it's, it's a recurring theme. It is a recurring theme. Pray. Let us draw near to the throne of grace that we may receive mercy. That's God, God has an ability to meet a need that you have. Amen? He sees it and He can meet it. And find grace in the time of need. Jesus is able and He is there to help us if we will come to Him. See what He tells you to do. Go to Jesus, number one. Consider where Jesus is at, number two. Hold to your confession of Jesus, number three. And consider how Jesus overcame, number four. Number one, go to Jesus. Go to Him. He's there waiting. Consider where Jesus is at. Where is Jesus at now? At the right hand of God? And some of my Christian friends would say where? Right here. He's inside me. Go to Him. Go to Him. Recognize where He's at. Set your mind on that, right? Set your mind on that thing. Hold to your confession of Jesus. What, what was your confession? What did you confess? Amen. What else did you confess? Ah! You confess that? You believe it? You believe it? Anyhow? Go, go to that. Go back to that. Remember, look, if you don't get it, he's trying to remind you of what you've already been cleansed of. Why would you go back to it? Remind yourself of what he did for you. Remind yourself of where you have come from and where he's led you to. Back to where Christ is at, where your life is hidden with God. Where at? At the right hand of the Father. Turn your minds back to heaven and away from your temptations. Because just because you're tempted, does that make it sin? No, otherwise Jesus was sinful. Look, he was tempted, right? The temptation is not the problem. The problem is giving into it. You don't have to. Consider how Jesus overcame. How did he overcome? He did. He used the word. How else did he overcome? Say again. He prayed. He overcame through that. Hmm. He considered his love for God more important than his own flesh's desire. Consider that. (laughs) Come to the throne of God. Pray, and your need will be met with what He is able to see and give you. That is mercy. That is mercy. Pray, and your need will be met with what He is able to see and to give to you. He will see the need. Look, that's what mercy is. Mercy is seeing a need and then having the ability to meet that need. And when I come to God and you're really meaningful in it, do you think, do you doubt that He won't give to you what you need? He will give to you what you need to endure it to overcome it, and to find a way out. Your spiritual eyes will be open to the door and you you can flee from it, amen? You don't have to. You don't have to sin. He will provide you grace and you will avoid the snare and the traps of sin, just like those mice did. I don't know how they did it. How in the world do all those mice, they go through, they eat all my bait and then get away? I don't get it. It's impossible. I can't even put my fingernail on that thing without getting smacked. But they have some way that they can do it, at least for a while. Look, you can avoid sin. You don't have to do it. You can avoid the snaps and the trip. Look at 1 Timothy 6, 9 through 14.
aren't you glad that God just doesn't leave it there? He doesn't just leave it there. He says, flee this and grab a hold of what? Look. Pursue it. Pursue these things. Righteousness. Godliness. Faith. Love. Steadfastness. Gentleness. Fight the good fight. Fight the good fight of faith and take hold. Grab that hold and take hold of the eternal right to which you were called, about which you made your good confession. In the presence of many witnesses, I charge you in the presence of God, who gives life to all things in the Christ Jesus, who in his testimony before Pontius Pilate made the good confession, to keep the commandment unstained and free from the reproach until the appearing of our Lord Jesus Christ. Have nothing to do with ir- I'm sorry, I'm in 1 Timothy 4, 7 through 10. Have nothing to do with irreverent silliness. Rather, train yourself for godliness. For while barely trained in some value, godliness is a value to, in every way as it holds promise, not only for the present life, but also for the life to come. This saying is trustworthy and deserving of full acceptance. So everything that you're doing here is designed for what? Somebody told me that this morning. Somebody told me that this morning. Everything, everything that God has you going through and learning right now, it's not like you're going to forget it when you get home. Amen? Amen. The saying is trustworthy, deserving of full acceptance. For to this end we toil and strive because we have our hopes set on the living God. His des- Do you see that? Paul's desire has what? Has changed from himself to what? To the living God, who is Savior of all people, especially of those who... And my friend, Mr. Bob's favorite word, to believe. He loves you. He loves you a lot. Remember who you are. Consider deeply what you love the most and who you love the most. Seek after it. Seek after it and train yourselves to be godly. Seek after it. This word grace, charis, Grace. I want to read you some of these words and think about it. Because God, you go, you go before the throne, you get mercy, right? God sees your need. He meets that need. But with that, He also gives you grace. He gives you grace. Listen, listen to this definition of grace. That which affords joy. You want that? Yeah. That which affords pleasure. That which affords delight. That which affords sweetness and charm and loveliness and grace of speech. To be given goodwill, loving kindness, and favor of the merciful kindness by which God, exerting his holy influence upon souls, turns them to Christ, keeps, strengthens, increases them in the Christian faith, knowledge and affection, and kindles them to exercise of the Christian virtue. What is due to grace? The spiritual condition of one governed, listen, the spiritual condition of one governed by the power of divine grace. We're talking, we just elected a president, right? God's given you something much greater than that in your life. To be governed, to be governed by his divine grace. The token of proof of grace, its benefits. Recompense, it is your reward. That's what God meets you with. See, he gives you the desire. He changes you. You, you go, you go before the Lord. In mercy, he sees what you need and he gives to you exactly what you need. You know what you need? Grace. You need that favor. You need that charm. You need to change your heart and desire from the world and its ways and the things that would draw you away from that into the things that he loves and the things that are of him. And your thoughts. Any other scriptures? I have one. Go ahead. Okay, if you confess your trespasses one to another and pray for a one another that you may be healed, the effective for the righteous man avails much. Amen. Again, prayer is the key. Well, when we confess it, then that opens the door for our friends to pray for us so that that sin will no longer have dominion over us. But can I share something? Can I? So. <laughs> I had a heyday this week because I thought I was mad at him and that I had a, I had, you know, that, that, that somehow or another something was there. And you know what? It wasn't true. There was nothing between. I love that man. I love him with, with all that I am. I love him. And, 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 but 
He thought, he thought I was too busy for him to pick up the phone and call me and to ask me about it. And, and he, he didn't do it. And, and, and for a couple days, he, he struggled with that. Why? Because, he would, because Satan was having heyday with him, making him try to believe a lie that was not true. That was not true. And I, I don't share that to embarrass him. But, but me and looked at each other in the eye this morning. What did we say to each other? I love you. 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 And, and we also made a commitment this morning. What was it? What was the commitment? B- between both of us. It wasn't just one-sided. Contact each other for the question. If there's ever any doubt, right? Yeah. Look, look, when you think things are going on, run. Just like you need to run to your where? Amen. Run to your father. Mm-hmm. Run to your father. If you feel like there's anything between you and God, run to your Father. Don't let anything, don't let anything get in the way between that. Who brings division? Who brings destruction? Those are the things that he wants. He wants to create division so that we will never become one. We will never become one with the things of God. We will never become one with each other. And it will lead us away from what God really wants us to be at Hannah Community Church. And on the greater picture, the body of Christ. Your brothers and sisters, you have brothers and sisters in other churches. Amen? Amen. That is a solid teaching. They, they are as much purchased by the blood of Christ as you are, and there's no differences. We share in the same grace, the same salvation, the same spirit, the same love, the same hope. We all have the same things, the same treasure, right? Yeah. But let us be, let us be mature. Let us be. You know what? When you start working those things, well, you know, I don't want to offend. It's not offensive. It's reconciliation. It's reconciliation. God, God, look, you have to reconcile to God. You had to come to Him. Uh, Go to each other. Reconcile. Be reconciled. Amen? Thank you for sharing this good word. Amen. (laughs) You you know, you... Oh. Michelle, Michelle's being, oh, the Lord is using Michelle this morning. I got to tell you, okay? You are exa- exactly right. Don't wait. Look, Matthew got up and ran immediately. He didn't say, well, maybe next week. He got up immediately. If it's there, run to it. Look at the opportunity that you have and run to it. Don't, good word, Michelle. We have also, uh, after all, have a ministry of Amen. As if God is making reconciliation between who? Himself and He's given to you. That's a ministry. It's good stuff. Let's go before the Lord. Most gracious and holy Father, before your throne, Lord God, as you, as you sit there, Lord, we come before you. We seek your heart. We, we seek your desires. We seek, we seek the things of you, O oh God. Inspire them to us, Father. Fill our hearts with a love for you greater than ourselves. Lead us, Father, into that that love of you that that overrides the flesh and just helps us to embrace and grab a hold of the things of you and the the things of your spirit, Father God. Lord, your angels sit over the churches as they stand before you, Father. The elders surround your throne. Lord, speak. Speak to us. Speak to them to speak to us, Father God. Impart to us your ways and your will and help us to embrace it. Even as my sister said, don't wait for it. Jump up and grab it and do what you've commanded us to do, Father God. In this portion, Father, we ask that you lead us not into temptation. Help us to avoid it, Lord, and to embrace your ways, to come to you, to pray, to seek your face and to flee from it, Father. Help us to open our eyes and our spiritual ears And watch and be aware, Father God, of what's going on and look for the doors of opportunity to avoid sin. Inspire us to life, O God, and let us inspire that to others. Fill us with the things of your kingdom and a new desire, Father, not for our flesh, but the things of you. We love you. We love you so much, Father. We love each other. It's in Christ's name we pray and everybody said,